work it, make it, do it, make sense. The night is dark. It's late, very late. Our hero has decided yet again to work on a side project. Yes, at last, it's going to work, I think, this time, maybe. So let's try this. Oh, yeah. Sorry. What's going on? Sorry. We are gonna do it. Okay, so, blah, blah, blah. It works, I'm so happy. All of a sudden, the door opened. What the hell are you doing? It's his wife. You're still working at 2 a.m.? You woke me up with your bloody music? Wait, 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 honey. It's, it's not what you think. It's, it's not work. It's actually a funny story. So it all started with a simple question. I, I wanted to make two devices, laptops, communicate with each other with uh, ultrasounds. And then I got carried away, and I created an awesome music instrument with my remote, you know? I don't care. I mean, if you used ultrasounds, I wouldn't be, I would still be sleeping, right? So why are you doing this? What's the purpose? I, I really don't see the point. Hello, everyone. My name is Hubert Sablonier. I work for um, Open Device and Open Web Technologies. And today, I want to, to talk about side projects, and especially the usefulness of side projects. And I think you may have um, experienced the same thing, whether it's with my wife or with uh, you know, some friends, my muggle friends, the non-IT persons. I always have a hard time explaining to them that a side project, the concept of a side project, you know? Well, first, I have a hard time explaining what I do for a living. So <laughs> I think just like you, I just say I build websites. So I try to avoid installing you know, printers on Windows, Christmas memories. Um, so then I have to explain that what I'm doing during my, my day life, my job as a developer, is completely different as what I do on my spare time. But because I use the same kind of skills, most of the people I talk with don't understand. I was trying to explain that to many kind of different professions, so uh, firemen, secretaries, doctors, etc. And because I'm using the same stuff I use to, uh, during my work day, they're like, but so why are you doing this? What, why, what's the purpose? Because it needs to have, uh, to have a purpose. And I, I completely disagree on that. And at some point, they are thinking that I'm some kind of, you know, sorry, that I'm some kind of uh, workaholic who doesn't really have a fulfilling life. And I, I really disagree because I think side projects are awesome. And today I want to celebrate them with you. And at the same time, I don't want to, to put pressure on anyone here or outside who don't have time to work on this. I mean, we all have other, other hobbies. We all have families to take care of, friends, etc. So I don't want to make a, an apology of, of working 24-7. Tw uh, Sorry. So I just want to take a step back and appreciate the value of side project. So for that, I want to tell you my, um, my ultrasonic adventure. So it all started in November. Uh, I was with my colleague at DevOx Belgium having fun. And you know, each time I go to a conference, when I go back home, I'm like, I want to test all those crazy technologies I saw. And so we got a bit serious, and we were talking about a project we're working on. So basically, it's a tool for trainers and um, professional um, conference speakers to display and control slide decks. So the general idea is a bit like 
PowerPoint um, speaker mode, you know, but in better. I mean, uh, uh, at least to our appreciation, of course. So here you can see the next slide, but it's a bit too small. I mean, if I'm standing here, I can see it, but if there's code on it, I can't read it. Same for the, um, the notes, it's really too small. And there's like lots of buttons that I would require a mouse to, to use them, and basically I have no mouse. So you have the same kind of problems on Keynote. Uh, fonts are really thin. I mean, it's Apple, so it needs to be, you know, great looking, but it's really not readable when you're really this far from the computer. So we prototype something which looks like this, and I'm currently using it on this screen, and we try to make the best use of the screen real estate. Uh, we also put lots of attention on the story. I mean, I'm here, I'm, I'm not here to to tell you about uh, how to do X, uh, technology X or Y. I'm here to tell you a story because if I wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be that different from uh, reading an article. So it's really important to, to put the accent on this. So instead of putting the notes for the current slide, we have, we have all the notes. We ba basically put the whole speech on the right. It's a scrollable area, just like a, a teleprompter. And this allows people to, speakers, to click on slide next at the very, very precise moment they need to, to tell their, their stories. So how does it work? So basically, it's just a web app. You browse it on your laptop. But you have to set up your computer as, as a, you know, extended desktop mode. And obviously, the second screen is, is the projector screen. So on this, I'm projecting <coughs> the, the UI you just saw, so current slide, next slide, etc. And on the projector screen, I just have the current slide full screen. And then I have a system with my remote that sends some kind of events on a, on a bus. And each component of my system, so the slide viewers, node viewers, receive those events, and then everything is synchronized. It works pretty well, and it actually requires no servers, which is really nice. So just have to browse a web page. But what happens if I want to do a demo? I have to fight with this in front of hundreds of, of people. Uh, going from extended mode to mirroring mode, driving the AV guy crazy because the screen is flickering in every every uh, direction, changing the font size or, or the resolution. So the problem is I, I would not use really extended desktop if I want to do demos. I would use mirroring mode, obviously. So I will display the same thing here and here. So when I want to move to you know my IDE, it would be displayed the same way, and I could code like this instead of like this. I would still have my remote sending events to only the, the laptop, because it's actually the same browser window. But then I would have another laptop. And it's actually the setup I'm currently using. So on this laptop, I've, uh, I have the current slide, next slide, notes, etc. But then I need something to communicate between the two laptops. So um, job day Uber would say, well, let's use WebSockets. I mean, I've already used them. It's fairly simple to use with some libraries. It's OK. It's safe. It's like we don't have time to <coughs> around, and we're going to use a solution we know. But it's not, uh, because if I want to make a bridge between the two, I will need a server somewhere to relay the events between the two parts. It's not that complicated. And I mean, I could have the server on one of my two machines. So I would say it's OK. But again, it's really not satisfying. I, I want to discover new stuff. And at lots of conferences, sorry, I'm going to low the sound, and I'll put it back again after. OK. Um, <clears throat> at some conferences, I heard about WebRTC. So I saw a few talks, but I never really used it. So on my spare time, I was like, hmm, maybe I could use WebRTC 
to do just the same thing to relay the events between the two machines without any server. And that's why I think side projects are awesome, because they allow me to discover stuff. So what is WebRTC? Anyone knows about WebRTC? So if you already know everything about it, you can fall asleep. There will be sounds after that will wake you up. So basically, when you hear about WebRTC, you often hear it's like Skype, but in a browser without any plugins, which, which is a, a good definition, or at least a simple one. And it's actually great. I mean, no plugins, just standard. It would be OK. And, and I'm actually using this with my colleagues. Uh, here you have Tolkien, but there's a lot of um, you know, Hangouts and Skype uh, competitors using WebRTC. But if you look at the specifications, who, who loves to read specifications? Right, one people. OK. Um, I don't either. But if you look carefully in the, the APIs of the W3C and the specifications from the IETF, the protocols and stuff, you see that you can exchange not only video and audio streams, but also any kind of data. So you have crazy experiments on the web using this. If you look at webtorrent.io, you can watch a movie, not any movie, this one, because it's a free and open source or Creative Commons movie. But the bits of the video are loaded through many nodes that have also opened the web page. And I think it's actually great. If it could be a way to decentralize a bit the web, it would be awesome. And lots of people are working on this. You also have uh, other very interesting ideas. Uh, this one allows you to share files between two laptops, two devices, without any server in between. And if you're in, on the same network, it, it works pretty well. Uh, so here I'm just sending an image. The other one is accepting it, etc. Um, so how does it work? Let's take John and Janice. So why not Alice and Bob? Because I mean, I love music, so let's use John and Janice. So John and Janice are on the same network. So they both have local IP addresses. And to put in place a connection, a direct connection between the two machines, on the same network, you have to do a round trip of, uh, to create this WebRTC connection. So first, John has to send an offer to Janice. Then uh, Janice will re uh, answer with an answer. So once you do this, you can create the connection. But in that offer and answer, you only have a few information, like, OK, we're going to do audio only on, or audio video, etc. But you, you don't have much information to contact and know where is your, if I'm, if I'm John, I don't know where Janice is. So you also have to send, um, in the other way, yeah, you also have to send ICE candidates. Uh, so a nice candidate is just a couple of an IP address, some ports, and TCP or UDP. So it's a way for John to say, you can contact me that way, and then Janice will answer with also some routes to go to for them to contact each other. So once you have done this, it's, uh, it's working pretty well. So let's take a demo. OK. So here I have a very, very simple demo. And because it's not that simple to display two laptops on the same screen, we're going to pretend it's two different machines. And Chrome on the left is um, John's laptop, and Firefox on the right is Janice. So here, I'm creating an offer. So as you can see, and it's not really interesting to see the details, at least right now, but you have what we called an SDP. It's just a lot of text describing the, the offer. And then we have the candidates. So I decided to put all that information inside the text area. So I can copy paste it there. I mean, my network is fairly simple, copy pasting. So here I just sent the offer to Janice. Then I can read the offer and create an answer. OK. Then I'm sending it back to John. I read the answer. 
and boom, the connection is open. So now I can send events, arbitrary data that I decided, like previous slide, and uh, Janice receives it, and then John can say next slide, etc. So that's pretty pretty nice, but sorry. But Hubert, you, you just copy pasted information. I mean, it doesn't work in real life. So the problem is that to create this direct direction, um, connection, sorry, you will need a server in between, a signaling server. And the WebRTC spec doesn't really force you to do it in any way. You, you can do whatever you want. So most people, let's imagine this server is on the local network. Most people are using WebSockets connections. And it, it's actually a bit like if you were using um, uh, what's the, uh, Skype. I mean, when you open the two clients, they are both discussing with the server at Skype.com or something. And here it's the same. So the idea is to say, I'm going to send this to the signaling server, and it's, gonna, it's going to be sent to Janice, so the offer and um, the ICE candidates. And then Janice is going to do the same. So once we have done that round trip through uh, a server in between, we'll be able to have a WebRTC data channel. So it's the one that only does arbitrary data, not video, audio video. So once I have this, I can communicate directly between John and Janice. And I think that's really great. And in my example, it's, it's actually not what I'm doing. I'm using uh, WebSockets. We, we'll discover why. Uh, but on my um, use case, I only needed local network. When you go to having the two machines on different networks, it gets tricky. So I have the diagrams, but it's not that simple to, to it, it could be done in a whole talk about WebRTC. But basically, you still need a signaling server. It would be on the internet, obviously. Uh, you would still do WebSocket connections to exchange you know, the, the offer, answer, etc. But Janice cannot contact John from, his, from our local network, because there's the, the public internet in between. So for this, we have what WebRTC calls uh, STUN. At least the, um, it was existing before WebRTC, this concept. But they are using a STUN server. And the idea is to say, uh, John will ask this server, who am I? And the server we will be able to answer, well, you have this IP address on the public internet, you have this port, etc. Alice does the same. And then with this, they are able to create a direct connection with each other. And then it's even more complicated because if you have some kind of um, symmetric nuts, something like this, it's clearly the point where it bored me a bit because I, I didn't have to use this for, for my experiment. But in some cases, you cannot do direct connections. So you need some kind of relay that will be um, used to uh, relay the information in between. And if you're doing audio video, it's like under a massive load. So if you want to do a Skype competitor, be ready for like, I think it's 15% of the people have NAT server that don't allow a direct connection and that would require a turn server. I'm going fast on this because, it, again, the idea is just to explain my adventure, and it wasn't the part that really that interests me the most. So what I really like about side projects is that it allowed me to learn so much about WebRTC, about NAT servers, network in general, etc. And I choose voluntarily to use the, the low-level APIs. If you want to do this in production, maybe you would need to use uh, polyfills and helpers. So this one is really great. It's maintained by the community and uh, browser vendors. Uh, it's the only library I, I used on the project. So it, it prevents you from having to deal with the differences between Chrome, Firefox, etc. And I would not advise you to use the low-level APIs. It's lots of boilerplates. 
Uh, I haven't shown you the code, but if you want, uh, if you want to uh, ask me at the end. And this helper is really nice. You, you just say, it, it's kind of a higher level API library to, to do WebRTC data channel. Um, so when you do web technology stuff, there's always the question, does it work in IE minus 42, you know? So where does it work? Well, basically, it works in Chrome, Firefox, um, Edge, and we'll talk about that. And Safari, it's a bit red. So at first, I was like, oh, and you've all read articles about this. Safari is the new IE, etc. I don't really, I don't really agree with that. Uh, Safari, for more than a year, has done lots of uh, efforts to um, communicate about what they do in in their release. So, if you look carefully, they are saying we are in development for WebRTC, which is really good news. I don't know how much time we'll have to wait, but it's in development officially. Uh, the problem with Edge is that the only thing they don't support is the data channel, so my experiment wouldn't work. But they say it's under consideration. It's a bit like at Christmas, you know, I want a Nintendo Switch, and your parents are like, we'll see. It's, it's a not yes, not no answer, so if you know people working at Microsoft, just shake their body and say, hey, we want this. Um, so. In my quest to do serverless uh, communication between these two, I was almost done. I mean, you all have heard of serverless, and I actually had a server in between, so it was serverless, as you know. And, um, but I really wanted something without a server. I really wanted serverless, serverless, you know, like the real, the real thing. So. I was back to experiments, and I really think side projects are awesome because you can experiment. So I was trying to find a way to create this uh, direct connection and to exchange the offer, etc., the, the answer, without any server. And if you look at the, you, you know, the IETF doing the RFCs, etc., every April 1, they do some jokes. So if you read carefully here, you can do IP over avian carriers. Um, so at first I was considering it and then not. Uh, then I saw lots of really interesting articles. So this guy uh, started experimenting with um, doing the signaling without any server. So he had an interesting way to serialize the information. And then, um, so he has a project on GitHub. Uh, and then I got to this website. Someone used QR codes. Hey, we find a, way, a useful uh, way to use QR codes. Um, so he also has a project on GitHub. So y if you want to do it between a, a laptop and a, a smartphone, you have to put them like that. You know, they are both displaying QR codes and filming each other. It's bit yeah, I, I can't see myself taking my laptop and doing this before I talk. So then I got thinking a bit. I, I, th I thought a bit about something I heard a few years ago. Anyone has a Chromecast here? Yeah. So I think two years ago we heard about the fact that Chromecast can use sometimes ultrasounds for the guest mode. So if someone is at your home, he wants to cast a video of a cat on YouTube, but he isn't on your Wi-Fi, he can. Uh, or at least what they explain in the documentation is that the TV is broadcasting some kind of small um, hash of a few characters as ultrasounds to make sure the, um, the phone can uh, interact with it. So I got interested. And I looked a bit. So Google also has a, a Chrome extension to exchange URLs with um, ultrasounds. Interesting. A few projects on GitHub. Again, I was maybe I want to reuse them, but it's not fun, you know. I, I really want to to learn more. So I, I read about those projects, and there's actually lots of great articles about this. But I really wanted to do it myself. So I got interested in Web Audio. 
Has anyone ever done web audio? So if you like music or if you don't, I'm not sure, but it's so much fun. So the first thing I try to, to do is to produce sounds. So let's um, try this. So it's the example you, see, you saw at the beginning. Uh, here I have a, a very, very small code. No libraries, like 45 lines. I'm listening to key downs, key ups, and I'm playing with sounds. So how does it work? Uh, basically, in web audio, you have a few nodes. Uh, the first most important one is the audio destination. It's the speakers. Then on it, you can create oscillators. So if there are Jean-Michel Jarre fans here, it's really great. Uh, here I can set it up to 440 hertz, so a perfect A3 or A4, depending on if you're English or if you took MIDI anyway. Um, but if you do this, you'll have huge, and I'm not doing it right now, but you'll, you'll have permanent sounds into your speakers. So to do my instrument, I also required a different kind of note. So here I can change the frequency to change the note. And here I added a new node, which is gain. So it's to control the volume. So here, uh, I, the gain is between 0 and 1. Here I have a 80% volume. And if I lower it, I can go to silent, which is actually, right now on my system, there's a web page oscillating at, I don't know which frequency. And when I'm going there, when I press, I just change the, um, the value of the frequency, as you can see here. So I'm just mapping the, the keys of my remote to some notes. And I'm also putting the gain at 40%. And when there's a key up, I'm going back to a gain of zero to make it silent. Um, the problem could be that it's monophonic. So I can't do multiple notes at the same time. I can't do chords. But if you like Zelda and Ocarina, as you know that an Ocarina cannot do two notes at the same time. So yeah, lazy uh, for us. It's great. Uh, I had to go on Wikipedia to learn about the different frequencies of different notes. But I think it was a, a very good experiment if you put on the side the fact that I had to wake up my wife. Um, then I, I had to detect sound. And then it got really interesting. So have you ever heard of DTMF? Yeah, one people. OK, so I haven't heard of it. In my research, I was like, hmm, this is interesting. And it's actually the system that's used and still used, but we, we knew it from, from when we were a bit younger. When we had phones, we were dialing, and it was making some strange noise. And it's actually, if you look here on the Wikipedia page, each number and the different characters, like uh, pound, stars, etc have a combination of two frequencies. So what I, want to, what I wanted to do back then was to emulate this with a mic. So the idea is to uh, use web audio to detect the frequencies and try to replicate this. So basically, it, now you have a node which is a, an input. So it's the microphone and you plug it to an analyzer. And that's when it gets tricky, because the, anal the analyzer just looks at the signal, and it can give you an array of, so each uh, part of the array is kind of a volume uh, of, of, of a frequency between 0 and 255. Two, five. And you have to map this to 0 between 22 kilohertz, yeah, OK. Uh, and so basically, I had to use stuff like request animation frame to frequently get measurements from the microphone. And each time I got the, the array I was talking about, I just have to map, oh, I have a high volume on this uh, index of the array. What kind of frequency is, is this? Is this one of the frequency of the DTMF code? And that's how I, I got to do it. So again, no libraries, 
only 56 lines of code. So does it work? That's the question. Failing demos, right? No? I w was about to display my phone on the screen, but something is not working. So I have a dialer here of the classic of Android. So let's try this. Yeah. Oh, five is not. Yeah. Mm, not bad. The problem with this is that it doesn't always <coughs> work perfectly well. And that's when you realize that it's a real job. I mean, um, sorry. I was playing around, but again, you have to be really deep into it to make a proper uh, detecting uh, library. But I had a lot of fun, and I think side projects are awesome for this. It's because you can play with stuff and, and just have fun. And try to explain that to, to a muggle that using what you do at your job, you can just have fun. And there's nothing after that. It's just like playing cards or watching a movie, discussing with friends. It's just fun for fun. And sometimes people are like, what? OK, so again, the, su the support is something is broken. No, the support is pretty, pretty nice for web audio. The problem is, if you want to use the mic, you have to use get user media. And for now, on Safari, it's not working. So I would be able to play the Ocarina on Safari on iOS, but I wouldn't be able to play it uh, I wouldn't be able to use my mic and do the DTMF demo. So then I got to the last part, the signal encoding. And that was really interesting, too. I have a degree in electronics, signal encoding, something, and computer science. And after three years of studies, I was like, let's select all the options about computer science. So I don't remember much about it. And it's funny to see that. Now it really interests me. And it interests me because it's fun. It's my rules, my hobby. And I can do whatever I want. Uh, so I really think side projects are awesome for this. So what I try to do, I, I will put a very simple example. So again, the context. I'm trying to send this whole offer and ICE candidates from here to here. So then I can make a direct WebRTC connection, which is when you explain it very crazy. But let's imagine I want to send hello. OK? Let's imagine I want to send hello. I have uh, five letters, but I actually have four different letters. So this message, I'm going to send it using a dictionary of the four letters that are used, E, H, L, O. So then I'm going to map each character to a, a number, let's say. So here it's the position in my dictionary. So H is letter 2, so 1, because it starts at 0. Uh, you get the point. So 1, 0, 2, 2, 3. Here I want to send this message. So what I did is frequency modulation. So I assign each number I want to send to a frequency to a node, we could say. So the first one is frequency 1, 0 is frequency 0, etc. The first problem I had is that if I have two letters, like the L's here, that are repeating, I need to find a way at the destination point to detect that it was longer. It's not that simple to do with web audio, because it's not that low level, you know, performant APIs. So I cheated and reused an idea I saw in one of the few projects I talked about. Um, I have a frequency to, ex to tell the destination I'm starting the message. And I use a frequency that is some kind of s useless space uh, that I use when I have repetitions. And I have a frequency to uh, indicate that the message is done. So once I have this, it's fairly simple. I just have to play the notes. And then on Janice, I just have to remove the space, remove the start uh, and finish, and then using the same dictionary, map it to the original message. 
So that's when demos are going to fail. Uh, yeah. So basically here you have my demo. Um, here the dictionary is hello. Well, it should be E-H-L-O, but you get the point. Uh, let's try. So I have the code here. I, I had to create a string codec to go from the text to the numbers and a sound codec to go from the numbers to the frequencies and, and back again. So here I can change the frequency I'm using. So first I'm going to use frequency you can hear. And sorry if it's a bit uh, hurting your ears, but should be OK. So let's use frequency we can all hear just for the, de the demo. OK. So. Hey, 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 I wasn't expecting this to work the first time. So what I did just here is using five frequencies. So three for the beginning uh, space and, and uh, ending, and two for zero and one. It's really just binary. Um, well, you can see that when I talk, it does <laughs> something crazy. Anyway. Um, that was pretty satisfying. The first time I, I transmitted something like this, I was at, at my co-working space, and I showed that to a co-worker, co and he was like, oh, it's a bit like um, Shazam, no? You, you could detect music. I was like, well, I'm way, way far from this point, I think. But he, he was excited. Um, so then I was uh, thinking about the fact that, basically, um, I have to OK. Yeah. I have to transmit this. So this is the offer I want to transmit. And the, the answer is looking is a bit the same. It's the same kind of uh, information. It's 380 characters, mostly ASCII, uh, strictly ASCII, actually. So ASCII is like 120 um, possibilities. So it was like, maybe I need 128 frequencies plus the space, etc. And oh, wait, I, I also need to transfer you know, the, the ICE candidates to know where to go. Oh my god, this is so much characters. And now you're like thinking about the 56k modems you had that was so slow. So the first try I did to when sending everything uh, of this with um, ASCII, it took 10 minutes to do the round trip. Not that great. And that's when you really, I, I really think side projects are awesome, because now I had a challenge. I, I, the first step was not that easy, but it was n not that complicated, too. Here I was like, how am I going to shrink this so it makes sense at, at the end? So that's where I found, because there's everything on the internet, someone explaining what you can remove from the SDP object. It's really, have you seen Pimp My Ride? Yeah? It's a bit like this. Well, let's remove this. It's useless. It's useless. It's just here, I won't be putting flat screens inside it. So um, if you look at the message, you can only keep uh, some IPs, some fingerprints, etc. So everything is explained in this article, and I just followed it uh, carefully. But once I've done that, I reduced from 10 minutes to something like four to five minutes. Don't remember the details, but I was still a bit disappointed because. I mean, under one minute would be great, but above wouldn't be really re usable. So that's where the string codec I was talking about, um, that's where I implemented smarter stuff. So in order to do, uh, not to send you know, the messages as you've seen before, with as many frequencies as characters, I had to change base. Oh, now I remember my, my lessons. So. If I have a dictionary of four letters, I have to send four char five characters because there's five letters. OK. But if I look carefully, and because I use four frequencies, I can decompose this as a number. 
right? So it's just changing the base. So here I'm using a base four, and it, it's actually 929. And then if I want to change it to more frequencies, like using 29 frequencies, I just have to use a library, I haven't done it by myself, to change the base and just send, instead of sending five characters, I'm now sending three. So it's like, well, you, you win two characters. No, I want a lot of percentage uh, of efficiency. And using this, I was able here to, let me show you, to have different dictionaries for the different parts I had to send. So in the object, sometimes I have IPv4, sometimes I have fingerprints, which are only hexadecimal characters. So I created a few uh, dictionaries to encode the different parts in the smallest possible way. So if I were to show you maybe an IPv4, um, yeah, an IPv4, so if I want to send this, whoa. Okay. Yeah, let's not do this. It's like 29 seconds. So we are going to change to more frequencies than just two. Um, let's try, I think we should try as ultrasounds now because again, I don't want to uh, harm you here. So. We're going to switch to 29 frequencies that most of us shouldn't hear, and the other one, don't complain, you're young, so uh, it's okay. Uh, so I'm here I'm like between around 17K and 20.9K kilohertz, so most of us shouldn't hear them. Uh, let me go back. Okay. Um, so I need to use the same dictionary on the left and on the right. And if I do this, okay. So here I'm gonna send it using 29 frequencies plus the three frequencies uh, I'm using for start space, etc. Okay. So clearly the speakers doesn't seem to to be loud on um, ultrasounds. So I'll try again. Yeah, it, it stinks a bit, right? I think 16.9K is a bit too low. Uh, so something is not working. I'm gonna try with my, um, my other laptop. Uh, so let me try this. What I can do is just show you. Here I, I sent an IPv4 without just using ASCII, but an IPv4 is just numbers, and numbers that goes between zero and 255. We don't need the dots. So what I, here you have like 12-ish, 15-ish uh, num um, numbers, bits to send. If I change the dictionary, and I'm gonna cut the sound just to show the output, I just have to send six bits. And the optimization on this is really, really nice. So I'm gonna go back to ASCII, especially here, and try to success a demo in, with ultrasounds. So let's try this. Sorry. So first try. No. Let's try this one more time maybe. Still no. I think the 16.9 is a bit too low. No, still not. It's not missing a lot of characters if I look at here. So I won't insist. It was working in the hotel room. It was working at home. Uh, maybe if I changed a bit the frequencies, 
let's just do a last one try with a bit less frequencies. So here I'm using 27 frequencies. I mean, I still have a bit of time, so why not try one, uh, one more time? Just like with the video games. One more time. OK. No. I was writing, hello, Devox UK. Sorry. Um, so yeah. So it's yeah. OK. So what was nice with this is that I really managed to shrink the message to only send three frequencies plus the start and finish, and to send this to Janice. So I managed to do a round trip in one minute something, which was my goal. And so I stopped working on it. And it's OK. And side projects are awesome because it's your garden. It's your project. And if it's not finished, it's OK. I mean, we don't have to follow those kind of rules. Like, you're not a real developer if you don't work all the time and have this great uh, you know, GitHub account. We, all, we are all mortals. And, and I, I really think we need to, to say it again and again to our friends, to each other. Let's stop this bullying on, oh, you don't have this? You don't know this? No. So your side project is whatever you want to do with it, and it's OK. So it's OK not to do too much documentation and test, sort of. Um, again, um, if, if you're in that kind of recreative side project, you do whatever you want. If you want to create your next to be startup, yeah, well, maybe you, you really need tests and, and docs. But then it's not really pleasure and side projects. It's working on, on, uh, on, on the side of your job. So, And I also stopped uh, experimenting with this because now I was accepted at DevOps France and DevOps UK to talk about it. So I had to prepare a huge amount of diagrams to share it with you. And that's why I also think side projects are awesome. It's a great way to share with your colleagues uh, in meetups, conferences, just to, you know, to transmit the passion. You, maybe you got a lot of passion these two days with uh, some presentations. On Monday, you'll have the responsibility to, to spread it like a disease, but a, a good one. So that's why I really think side projects are awesome. So this is not a story about waking, waking up your husband or wife. They would totally have the right to be mad at you. Uh, but when I, think, when I think back about the questions my wife, my wife asked, why do I do that? What's the, the purpose? Well, in less than two weeks, I discovered uh, new technologies, WebRTC, WebAudio. I learned so much stuff about networks, NATs. I experimented with ultrasounds, music, notes. I had lots of fun challenging myself on this project. And I would say it's really, really not that bad for a useless project. Thank you very much. <laughs>